So, uh, all of this is really interesting so far. So I'm going to be a little repetitive in the beginning, but I promise there will be a point to some of the repetitiveness of. Uh, my name is Davia Downey. I wanted to say thank you to IFSR, um, uh, Matt Grossman, for um, inviting me. I would like to thank all of you for spending some time with us this afternoon. Um, I'm also uh, a professor at Grand Valley State University. Um, you already heard all of that, but I'm also a volunteer for Voters Not Politicians. So much like um, some of the individuals in the room all across the state, uh, I have been um, fervently working on this particular policy for the last, um, gosh, it seems like forever, but probably about 13 months. So I'm going to talk about some of the finer points of the policy itself. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, commissions and how they vary across the United States. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we came to develop the, pro the policy itself. So those are the things that I'm going to cover today. Um, so uh, redistricting in the U.S. Is actually takes lots of different flavors. There's lots of different variations. So what we see is in most of the states, in the majority of states, 37, uh, this legislature has the primary control over drawing the district lines every 10 years. So they get information from the U.S. Census. They use that information on population, uh, number of voters, and they are re responsible for drawing maps. 42% uh, 42 states actually have primary control over congressional lines. So there's two things that we want to know about redistricting to begin with. The first thing is that um, state legislatures have responsibility over their own lines, but they also have responsibility from the census and the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, to drawing uh, lines that will send congressional delegations to Washington, right? So when we talk about state legislatures, they may do one of those things, they may do both of those things. There's also uh, various different kinds of commissions, and I kind of wish that my slide was a little bit smaller, but I will talk about these all in um, form. So there's essentially four different kinds of commissions. The first one is an advisory commission. And so in the states that use advisory commissions, they basically either have bureaucrats that provide information to the legislature to make decisions about drawing lines. They may have um, a series of retired um, politicians or judges that serve. Um, at, in an advisory capacity, and they provide information and data to the state legislature in order to make those redistricting decisions every 10 years. In some states, we actually see backup commissions. So this would be in the, effort, in the event that maybe the state legislature can't agree on, uh, on a map or a set of maps, right? So we would need to throw this to another body in order to sort of tie break the situation, as we heard from um, Richard, that was a problem in the state of Michigan, and we've never, you know, we've never really been able to resolve that. We don't have a backup commission. It seems to be in the Constitution, but again, we've never really used it. Um, uh, so these are the states that are actively using backup commissions right now. We also have in some other states politician commissions. So politician commissions are essentially selected by the state legislature to serve on the commission, and they do this every 10 years with the decennial census. And those politicians are actually responsible for not only advising the state legislature, but also providing information on the districts themselves and how they should be formed. And there are a few states, or there's actually a, there's a couple more that are listed under there, but I can provide the slides if you want to see them later. Um, and those are what we would call independent commissions. And these are the commissions that have no politicians. They don't. Uh, they are not a bureaucratic body like you would see in an advisory <coughs> commission situation. Uh, they are typically made up of citizens, and these uh, they have uh, various different kinds of selection criteria. And there's eight states across the United States that currently use independent redistricting commissions. And so that's kind of what we are centering on in terms of the BNP policy that I'm going to talk about uh, today. Um, so we've already heard this several times. Uh, the Constitution basically, um, the U.S. Constitution, basically requires every state to create an apportionment plan every decade. So the um, decennial census that we do every 10 years is the main database that is sent to the Secretary of State and or whatever uh, um, uh, body that is similar to that in another state. Um, that U.S. Census data is basically uh, used to determine where people live geographically and also helps us with two things. The thing that the federal constitution requires each state uh, apportionment plan to include is equal population by district, right? So again, you could do this very simply mathematically. It may not actually equal like nice little squares that people think, tend to want to see, but you could basically take that reapportionment U.S. Census uh, data and divide districts and that would be it, right? The other thing though that complicates that issue is that you also have to pay attention to 
Voting Rights Act um, legislation. So there are, there, it would be very difficult for us to sort of throw a bunch of numbers together, create an equal number of districts, and not unfairly or, or disproportionately affect minorities. And so the Voting Rights Act actually does require these commissions or the state legislature to have some considerations over what those lines should look like. And so these are the two factors that the U.S. Constitution really wants us to focus on. And then again, across all of the different states in the United States, they have various other criteria that they use in addition to those two points to draw their state legislative lines and or draw their congressional uh, lines for delegation. So in Michigan, um, as, as uh, Richard and also Corey have said, um, we have a state legislature that is responsible primarily for drawing the state legislative district lines and the congressional lines. Um, there are committees that actually are formed in each house, uh, each the Senate and the, and the House, um, every decennial census, and they are populated according to the majority party. So what that basically means is that every 10 years, depending on the last election, those seats are allocated in those, com uh, in those committees based on party, based on, based on uh, uh, party lines. Um, after those committees do their work, those maps are then submitted to the state legislature, uh, and uh, there's a gubernatorial veto that is possible, so if, you, if the governor doesn't agree with those maps that have been submitted and voted on by both chambers, they can veto those. If there is a problem with the maps or there is a legal case that is brought against the way that those maps are formed after the public is, has seen them, there is the option of a Supreme Court challenge. And there have been some that have happened in the state of Michigan um, over the last 10 or 15 years. I'm sure that you can provide some information on that as well. Um, so those are basically the ways that um, we approach redistricting in the state of Michigan currently. So just to sort of show you how this goes, this is a map from 1973 to 1982. So um, a lot of times in, the, in, in my work with the campaign and sort of presenting um, this information all across the state, uh, people say that the lines have always kind of looked the same. Well, we know that every 10 years, these subcommittees on both the state and the, 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 the Senate side and the House side change, right? Because uh, the state voting, uh, voting results have changed. So over time, these maps will change. The lines actually change based on the way that these congressional committees come together and develop the lines every single decade. So this also is one of the things that Corey was mentioning as well. It makes it very difficult to sort of see any trend lines because every 10 years, those lines change. And you have very few elections in between those decades to sort of pull and project some results from. So this is from the 1970s, um, and just follow the pictures. <laughs> This is from the 1980 redistricting uh, component. Now, again, remember that U.S. Census um, data is coming from the, the coming from the U.S. Census, and our population is also shifting at that time. So, if you look from the 1970s, see up there at the UP, to the 1980s, you see some changes going on in the western Michigan and the southern half of the state. When we get to the 90s, we also start to see some other things that are occurring in terms of the district lines and the um, sort of electoral consequences to those things. And then we get to um, the 2000s, uh, and we see, uh, again, some narrowing, some more focusing of these different district lines. And then when we get to the last uh, reapportionment uh, period in 2011, this is the maps that we currently have in the state of Michigan. Okay, so if we go all the way back through, we can see how these different parties, these different subcommittees in both the state, House, and the Senate have redrawn these lines, right? And some of it is based on population. Some of it is also based on where we live. But some of it is actually based on some of that decision making that occurs at the committee level. All right. So um, that brings me to why I'm here today, basically. So um, Voters Not Politicians uh, began um, in early 2017, I guess it was 16, thank you, 2016, um, discussing this, this issue, it was something that sort of uh, generated, and a lot of people hear this all the time, it seems like a really fun factoid, so I'll repeat it here. We started from a Facebook post, uh, and people all across the state was sort of like, that seems like an interesting thing for us to pay attention to. I've been paying attention to it myself as a voter within the state of Michigan, and so when I saw this Facebook post, I showed up at a meeting, and people were like, hey, you seem to know some stuff, why don't you help, <laughs> why don't you help us with policy? And I'm like, sure, let's do that. So at the very beginning, it was really a citizen-led effort. Um, and what we did in the very beginning is we held 33 town halls all across the state of Michigan. And we really went to voters and citizens that were interested in learning more about what I presented already, about the process of redistricting, how it's done in other states, and we asked them questions about what it was that they don't seem to like about the current system. 
Uh, we asked them things about redistricting as well, so things about representation, things about what they sort of saw in their own districts that were problematic for them. So we collected data from all of the attendees from these town halls, and that actually informed the way that we developed our policy, which is really critically important. Um, so we did a citizen education uh, and survey, and we included questions on you know, what features Michiganders wanted to see in commissioners, uh, and what aspects of redistricting they wanted to see reformed. Um, and then from that, um, uh, behind the scenes, there was a policy committee of Michiganders. We had very broad membership. We had some lawyers. We had political scientists like me. We had uh, doulas. We had veterinarians that actually served on these policy commissions. Essentially because we were a volunteer-led organization, if somebody came to us and said, I'd like to volunteer for that, I'd like to research that aspect, I'd like to do that, we said, okay, you can do that. And we would, we would find a way for them to be incorporated into the process. Um, and so that actually really um, uh, really resulted in something quite beautiful, which I'll, I'll talk about in just a second. The other big thing that we wanted to make sure that we did as a policy committee is build on what we currently do in the state of Michigan. So our policy does include a pulse standard. So uh, Richard was talking about that, um, not breaking a whole lot of lines, contiguousness, compactness where it's reasonable. We built on that. But the other things that we added were um, the, um, the addition of population diversity and the prohibition of favoring and disfavoring candidates. And so I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail. We also added the feature of respecting communities of interest. So if you think about this, uh, the city of Lansing, currently right now we think we have three congressional representatives. We have various different state representatives, uh, 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 three different congressional representatives that are in just this particular area. We also have um, several different house representatives that sort of divide the city of Lansing in East Lansing, Bath, Hazlitt, Okemos. And when you look back at that map that I showed before, I won't go all the way back there, you can see where those divides happen. If you look at the state maps actually in the state of Michigan, the state house and the state senate maps, it's even more egregious in some, in some cases where you sort of see different patterns of where these lines wiggle and waggle. Now, of course, remember, the lines are actually the visual representation of what's going on here, so I don't want you to feel that funny shapes are the thing that we're trying to, you know, trying to eradicate. It's really the process by which those funny shapes come to be. That's the thing that's the most important part. <clears throat> All right, so um, as I said before, Voters Not Politicians is a citizen, uh, what we would be developing here is a citizen-led commission of Michigan voters without politicians that would serve. So unlike a backup commission that might be made up of, of past politicians, unlike an advisory commission um, that you see in other states that might have um, some political representation on it, this commission would be made up of Michigan citizens not without any, uh, without, uh, that have not had any previous um, a po political experience. The other big things that you want to know about the BNP policy, just to, to, to begin with, is that it must adhere, obviously, to the U.S. Constitution. So they need to have equal population, the maps that are developed. They need to follow the issues of the Voting Rights Act, obviously. Um, and they also must be approved by a majority of the commissioners. And this is a feature that I really want to sort of um, hone, hone in on. So I'm going to talk about the selection criteria for the commissioners next. But what we require is on this commission that the people must agree. And it's not a simple majority. It actually requires agreement across all of the commissioners, regardless of their partisan stripes. So when we say nonpartisan, that is what we mean, is that it's not about one group of people being able to run the table every single decade uh, in terms of the maps. We actually require them to delegate and deliberate between each other so that when they present the maps to Michiganders, that they would know that every bucket that would be represented on that commission has reached some consensus. The other big things that we wanted to do, um, it obviously, is to remove, to make the commission independent. So we want to remove partisan bias by requiring diverse representation. Uh, we also have language in the policy that present, prevents the transfer of power or manipulation from any of the three branches of government. We do know that there have been some examples in uh, of Michigan's history where that has been problematic, and we knew that. You know, as, just as being a regular Michigan citizen, you sort of watch politics, it touches you in some way, and you can see how sometimes the legislature may or may not do certain things, or the governor may do certain things, uh, or even the judicial may do some things. And so we wanted to make sure that this commission was protected from undue influence, right? Now, not just now, but every single decade that it happens in the future. We really wanted to make sure that it was, um, that it was protected. 
The other big thing that the commission will be required to do is hold public hearings. Um, and every meeting that they hold as a commission and every report that they do <coughs> as a commission would be made open to the public. So in, in a state that actually has fairly low transparency scores um, compared to other states, this was also something that was very important for the policy committee to, um, to enshrine in the policy. And also it seems to resonate very much with um, Michiganders that we talk to all across the state. <clears throat> All right, so the proposed process, um, the first thing that I should say about this is that uh, the Secretary of State is sort of the administrative administrative role. It, it plays a very, very minimal role in terms of uh, candidate selection for the commissioners. So the Secretary of State would be responsible for circulating from the voter, you know, from the voter pool, uh, 10,000 applications for the commission. Um, and from that, obviously, there's going to be some people that may not decide to serve, that may be uh, disqualified to serve, and uh, so that number would be uh, whittled down. They also have to make sure that they um, uh, solicit applications from uh, various regions of the state. So the UP people all the way up in Copper County, all the way down to, you know, uh, the Ingham County would have to, you know, they, they would need to be spread out. The second thing that the Secretary of State would then do is verify applicants' eligibility to serve. So I will talk about this in more detail in just a second, but they are responsible for sort of vetting these applications themselves. Obviously, in this application, you would have to make a choice about what bucket you would belong to, and you, we would, you know, the Secretary of State would be responsible for making sure that um, the, the statements that you make are truthful. Um, and then uh, from the applicant pool uh, that's then developed and whittled down in that second step, it should mirror the demographic and geographic makeup of the state. We really would like to see people from the UP part of this commission. We want to see people from the upper, uh, from the upper northern part of the state represented on this commission. That's not necessarily the truth. The, the, that's not necessarily true with the state and senate committees that currently exist, right? It's sort of whoever gets picked in terms of their committee service for that year for that specific role, there's not a whole lot of uh, geographic representation or demographic representation, and we wanted to make sure that we provided a way for that to be possible. Um, from that second, sort of that, that third iteration, um, the uh, Secretary of State would then create a randomly selected pool, um, and that would get to our 13 members. There's a step that happens in between here, so I do want to also make sure uh, that, that I mention this. Um, is that the state uh, parties would also be able to have some preemptory strikes from that last commissioner pool, right? So there would be a, a pool that would go in front of the state legislature and uh, the party heads of both parties would then be able to strike. So let's say, for example, uh, somebody uh, sort of gets through the process, they're screened and they say that they're a Republican, but somebody in the state legislature happens to know that they are a closet dem and they've decided that they want to run for that slot in the, on the Republican side, the party would then be able to strike that person from the pool and they would not be considered for service. Um, this also allows us to have a randomized pool, so in case there are some commissioners that would not be able to serve the entirety of their of the term, that we would have people that have been vetted and have already been through the process that could act as a backup if we needed to do that during the time. One of the other things that we should also mention, or at least I should mention here, is that redistricting takes time. You know, this is not something that happens in a month or two. It's actually something that happens usually over the process of about a year, uh, sometimes to a year and a half. And so we want to make sure that um, the commissioners that will apply and that will receive applications understand that this is a role that will be long term. All right. So the 13-member commission will be made up of four Democrats, four Republicans, and five unaffiliated or um, or affiliated with a minor party. So we also know that throughout um, multiple elections here and in the future, that the two major parties may not be Republicans and Democrats. And in fact, the language, I use Republicans and Democrats here, but the language actually is written in a way that says whatever the two majority parties are, are the ones that would have those four seats that would be allocated to them. So in the future, if we have a Green Party and a Libertarian Party that win elections at the statewide level, those would be the ones that would be the two buckets, right? <coughs> oh, Lord. Same is happening all the time. All right. So some other things about, I'm going to fly through the rest, but I promise if you have more questions, I can answer them when we get to it. Um, so the first thing that we should know is that obviously all commissioners must be registered to vote. Uh, commissioner service does have some restrictions. 
Uh, they must not be a declared or elected officials uh, for state, federal, or local office. They cannot be a member of the uh, leadership board of a national, state, or local political party. Uh, we do disallow any paid consultants from serving. We disallow employees of the legislature. Uh, if you are a past employee of the legislature, though, you are still okay to, <laughs> to serve. Um, and uh, you cannot be a registered lobbyist, and you cannot be related, parents, spouses, children, stepchildren, to anyone in the categories above. The other thing that is uh, <coughs> cut off from the bottom here is that commissioners are also ineligible for running for office within five years of their commissioner service. And we also included that because we wanted to make sure that somebody that serves on this commissioner would not gain the table in their favor, right? This is something that's really critically important, and that's something that we've heard um, all across the state as well. So um, the current process right now with these two uh, committees that exist in the state senate and the state house, um, it's usually done behind closed doors. There is testimony that's actually available, and it's widely, you can look back and sort of see how, how that, that testimony in the last um, redistricting session uh, went, went down. Um, you can see how those votes sort of played out in those different commissions. If you want to know how to find those archives, I can, I can provide that information as well. Um, again, what I want to reiterate here is that this new commission, this Independent Citizens for Redistricting Commission, um, would be drawing maps with clear criteria, fairly and transparently. And that means that basically anyone from the state of Michigan that wants to look at the records, wants to look at the, the testimony, wants to look at the conversations of, that the commissioners have together, they would be able to do so. If they want to provide data to the commissioners, they can do that. If they want to provide maps to the commissioners for consideration, they can do that as well. So this is really a process by which where the commissioners will be engaging with conversations with citizen, uh, citizens all across the state in order to draw these maps. Um, so I've already talked about this as well. It does include the APOL standards. It does include um, the two additional things that I added there. Uh, not to draw in favor or disfavor any candidate or uh, uh, incumbent must be reasonably con uh, compact, must reflect diverse population, and have respect for communities of interest. Um, and uh, the process will have uh, reports, methodology, and data that must be made public. So this is something that is also really, really enshrined in the policy as well, making sure that these things are uh, fair, independent, and transparent. Um, and then, again, as I said before, the majority of the commissioners must reach agreement before approving any maps. And in fact, the policy actually has a stopgap, so let's say that there is uh, some disagreement. Um, we would actually ask the, the, the commissioners that are on the, uh, the commission to um, rank order their maps. And from that second order rank order, that would be the way that we would choose it. We would not throw it to the legislature to make the decision. We would not throw it to the judicial, to the courts to make that decision. It would really be commissioner breath, right? It would really be from <coughs> the information that comes from the citizens throughout the process. Um, if you want to find out more, if something that I said resonates with you, if you want to find out more about the organization itself, uh, if you want to become a volunteer, I suppose, like me, feel free to go to voters.politicians.com and find out that what our efforts are and what we will be, because we will probably be in your neighborhood sometime in the next few months. All right, thank you guys so much for your time.